and run the mics. So if you don't mind kind of moving in, we uh, promise not to bite. Um, so welcome, I'm Danielle Linzer. I'm the Curator of Education and Interpretation at the Andy Warhol Museum here in beautiful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and I have the pleasure of facilitating today's session on basics, planning for accessibility. This is a great building block session uh, for those who are starting out or for those who want a refresher um, on uh, a kind of getting access moving at your institution, be it a museum or a performing arts venue. Um, and we are very lucky to have today uh, Robin Jones who is the executive director of the Great Lakes ADA Center with us, who is an expert on these matters. Um, Robin is going to walk us through a presentation and then we'll have time for a Q&A afterwards. So unless it's extremely urgent, um, I encourage you to kind of jot questions um, and comments and ideas down uh, because we will have time for a rich discussion after the presentation. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, and thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Great. Well, welcome everybody. And I'm Glad that you were willing to move in a little bit. It's such a huge room for for this, and it's cold enough in here, hopefully, to keep us all awake at the same time, which is a, is a positive. So let's kick off and use our time wisely to talk about planning for accessibility. Just for a, a quick, how many of for you, is this new to you? Is this something that you're just coming into, um, that it is, uh, you're, you're here to learn more about how to go about the process? How many of you that's... How many of you, it's like a refresher, you're kind of, you've been in it, you're coming here just to see if there's anything new or there anything different that you haven't thought about? Okay, great, thanks. Just want to get kind of an idea um, about that. So what we're going to be doing is going through a step-by-step th step through developing an access plan itself, talking about some tools that are available to assess what you do and, and don't have and what can, how you can use them. We're going to talk a little bit about methods for developing some sound policies, practices, and procedures. And then some ways to go about getting buy-in from the disability community and your colleagues. So one of the first things is calm, take a deep breath. It's not as horrible as you might think it is or overwhelming it as it is. But then as soon as you get into it, now you can panic and freak out. <laughs> because it is an, a, a, an overwhelming task to, to get to, to think about because there's so much to it and there's always that fear that I'm not doing enough, um, that there's more that has to be done or I've done it wrong, um, and what's the consequence of doing that and such. So hopefully as you, as we talk through these things today, I can alleviate some of that panic um, scenario, give you some framework in regards to how to move forward um, to even wrap your head around some of these issues. And please understand that this is an ongoing process. This is something that you will be doing for a long period of time. This is not something that it gets accomplished in a week, a month, six months, or whatever. Because like anything in your organization, it is something that has to be sustained. You can't do it once and think you are done. Every time if you're in a theater, you have a new show, you have to think about it. Every time you're in a museum and have a new exhibit, you have to think about it and such. These are not things that you know, that you can just walk away with. Yes, in an architectural context, once I've built my building accessible and I've got my ramp entrance and I have my accessible bathroom, in some ways I don't, I can let my guard down a little bit about those things, but stuff happens and concrete breaks up, you've got snow and ice on that ramp, you've got a grab bar that breaks or a fixture that breaks, it doesn't work anymore, it has to be fixed, and what are you going to do as an alternative in the meantime? All of these things, like anything else in your operations, they do have sustainability issues associated with them, some more so than others. So why should you have an uh, access plan? Just a little bit from Historica. One of the first reasons that I think, as far as articulated by Access um, uh, uh, Australia, says that the process gives organizations the opportunity to undertake a cycle of continuous improvement in relationship to access and gives them an opportunity to add value and increase their impact. I think this is a valuable um, kind of rationale. And this is why we want to, um, and what the message we want to be taking to our administrators as to why is this important for us to do. Um, because you know they need to understand that this is something that we want to make sure that we are reaching everybody and that we have a global and broad impact in what we do for all of those who might be participating in our program. And then the more negative side, but the reality side of it is that there's also a legal reason to consider as to why you want to have an access plan. 
you're going to have inevitably, inevitably complaints. And you don't want to end up in the courts. Okay? So if nothing else, that's, you know, if, if you can't sell it on the altruistic reasons why you should do this, add a little fear. It doesn't hurt. Okay? Uh, sometimes when I work with people with disabilities in the community who contact me and talk about being frustrated because of access issues that they've tried to resolve with an organization, they've tried to advocate on behalf of themselves or others to try to get an entity to change, and that entity doesn't listen. They just keep pounding away and say, you know, they either get brushed off or something else. And they do. I often say, a well-placed complaint can often accomplish more than anything else does because it does bring attention and causes people to have to react. It's not the best way to do it, but sometimes it is the only thing that works if you can't move things forward. I've actually had individuals working within organizations who have actually encouraged their customers to file complaints because they're not able to get their administration to listen to them. And they're internal. They're trying to advocate and get things done, and they're not able to do it. And so they actually encourage some of their participants to say, file a complaint with us. This will help me. If they hear from you from the outside that this is an issue, this will help me to accomplish what I need to do. So there's, you know, there's sides to everything. Some of you may be familiar with what is often referred to as a drive-by lawsuits type of a scenario that's happened in different places across the country. Now, coming from Chicago, drive-by lawsuits is not a terminology that I really relish because the, the drive-by context is very negative in Chicago from a violence perspective. But what is basically occurring in many places across the country is lawyers are teaming up with individuals with disabilities and they go through Main Street and they go around and they don't even necessarily come into your facility, but they'll do an external review of your parking lot or they'll look at your entrances and things of that nature and they'll file complaints and then they'll come back at you and say, well, we'll resolve this issue if you provide us X number of dollars, you know, we'll withdraw our complaint or whatever else might be. They don't necessarily result in more access. Um, but they um, can be kind of an extortionist plan in some scenarios um, if you want to look at it that way. You don't want to be in that circumstance. So the better and the more you're prepared you are, the um, better you can ever protect yourself 100%, but it's something to think about in regards to that. So what is an accessibility plan? It outlines a simple approach to how your organization intends to proceed to become more accessible to people with disabilities. And we know that if we can make ourselves more accessible to people with disabilities, a much wider audience is then served. Because it's not just people with disabilities that benefit from wider doors, from ramps, from elevators, from grab bars in the bathroom, and things of that nature. It's mothers with kids in strollers. It's mothers with children in, um, of the opposite sex in the bathrooms. It's individuals who don't see themselves as disabled, but, but are, may have limitations, and thus benefit from grab bars and other kinds of things. It's individuals with temporary disabilities. There's a lot of different reasons why access is something that benefits everyone, not just one sector of the population. It serves as a blueprint for your board and your staff, et cetera, to follow. It's a guideline, something to look to. It's not just talk about it, but it actually gives us something to refer back to in a written format. It documents the process so that as your staff change, the concepts are not lost. So often with organizations and entities I've worked with, there's been that passionate person in the front office or the passionate person that's worked there who's driven the process and then they leave to greener pastures or they retire or whatever and a lot of that is lost because it wasn't contained in their mind or in their processes and it wasn't documented well in regards to what was needed and what needed to go through. So that's why it's really critical to think about documentation. Also, documentation serves as a good faith effort so, uh, and documents a good faith effort should you ever be subject to a complaint. So that it's not just me saying, well, we were considering that, we've been working on that issue when we're questioned, but we actually have documentation to show, hey, that this is something that we have in process. We have a plan in place. We may not have achieved 100% of that plan, but we have a plan in place versus the person who can't even show or entity that can't show other than verbal discussions that they've ever even done anything. It also sends a message to the public that your organization is serious about these issues and such when we go through this process, when we know that we're going through this process and they understand that it's not something that you take my concerns lightly, that you take my concerns seriously and you view me as a valuable member of your audience or your um, customer base. 
So an accessibility plan covers four different areas. One is we look at the physical. What's the bricks and mortar? Okay? When I think of the physical, I take a building and I turn it upside down and shake it. And when I put it back upright again, everything that is still there is my physical access. That's my bricks and mortar of the entity. Those other things, like the stuff that fell out, it's not permanently installed, etc., into my building, like my temporary chairs that I might put in, change my, my layouts and things of that nature, my bleachers, my um, uh, tables and chairs and things of that nature. Um, all of that is part of my program accessibility. That's what I'm doing to make the program overall accessible to people. So I've got my physical access, my building the bricks and mortar, and then I've got the programs that take place inside of it that may move around, be temporary, be permanent, you know, things of that nature. Communication, huge issue. And communication is not just you and me talking to each other, it's how we communicate everything. Whether we communicate things through visual, whether we communicate things through auditory, whether we're using multimedia, who we communicate with, telephone, the methods that we do, our website, our flyers, our posters, our ads in the newspaper, radio spots, whatever we're doing. And then, of course, our administrative processes. Those policies and procedures that make us tick. Those policies and procedures that we follow to make sure that things go along the way they should go along in a consistent manner that drives what we do and how we respond to things. So we're going to talk about all of these areas as we go through today. Don't forget employment. Oftentimes, a lot of focus in this conference and says it's been on the customer side, the, your, your um, uh, participant side of things. We are all also employers. And whether we're large or small, the chances are we're going to have people with disabilities in our workforce, either visible or invisible. And hopefully, we're in um, the process of also looking at how inclusive our employment practices are at the same time. So employment is a piece, we're not going to focus on employment, it's a whole other thing, but I do think that employment is a huge area that people need to make sure that you still also take into consideration because there are still policies and practices in employment. Your employee could be the one with a disability, not just your um, program participant. An accessibility plan identifies what are our assets, what do we currently have going for us. You want to document your assets. What do you have already in place? What is already accessible? But it also documents the deficits. None of us are perfect. Even those that think they have the most accessible facilities in the world, it takes one janitor to put one garbage can in front of an automatic control or something of that nature, and you just negated your accessibility. So you have to think about that in the context that nobody is perfect. You still have all have areas. What are our priorities? And not only our priorities from our own internal perspective, what are our customer or our client's priorities? We want to understand what is most important to the people that serve, that we serve, that come to enjoy our facilities or participate in our programs. What are their priorities as well? And how do they mesh with our priorities? In that regard. And then what actions need to be taken, which should be inclusive of what's the time frame that we're going to do it in? Is it a three month? Is it a six month? Is it a year? Is it a five year capital campaign issue? And then who's going to be responsible? And who is not necessarily a person's name, but it could be a position, because we know people move in and out of positions. So this is the responsibility of front office. This is the responsibility of house manager. This is the responsibility of whatever. Not Joe, Sally, Sue, or whatever. Because again, you have a plan here that should live, should not be tied to a specific person. You want your plan to recognize the diversity of needs within the disability community. 
and you want it to integrate access into the fabric of your organization or institutionalize it. We don't want it to be that, oh yeah, we should think about this after the fact. When we have a new show coming in, we should have that issues, all of those issues on that same checklist as all of the other issues are. It shouldn't be, we go through all that whole checklist and say, oh yeah, we need to consult with X, Y, and Z about people with disabilities participating in this program. That is the after the fact. It should be in and up front. You want it to become institutionalized. These are things that everybody thinks about all the time. When we do purchasing, procurement, when we do you know, planning and scheduling, when we do budgeting, etc. One of the most irritating things in the world for me is when it comes up and says that we don't have it in the budget. Why don't you have it in the budget? Because you did not integrate it into your planning process when you did your budgeting. When I figure out my costs for a show, I should be including sign language interpreter costs. I should be including real-time captioning costs. I should be including other things if I need to replace or add new assistive listening device systems or things of that nature. That should be included in the cost of production, the cost of implementation, et cetera, up front. Not, oh yeah, after the fact, let's figure out what it's going to cost now to become accessible and let's figure out who's going to pay for it. Uh-uh. That needs to be in the whole process so when we budget, we determine our fees, we determine whatever, but that's all integrated into it. For some of us, we're there. For others, it's still that extra or that special or different. We want to change that mentality and change that culture and get it across to our administrators that this is something that is part of ongoing. It's not something we're doing special. It's not something that we're doing out of the goods of our whatever. We're doing this as part of our, this is business, this is regular operational procedure. Take into consideration the organization's unique circumstances and um, situations. Understand that one size does not fit all. There's so many variables in your organizations. So what works in one children's museum may not work in another children's museum. There's differences in how you run. You know, or, or one theater may not be the same as the other theater is. Your resources are different, your staging is different, the types of performances that you do are different, your scheduling is different. So one size is not fit all. You can learn from other people in regards to their accessibility plans, and that's why it's really great to have consortiums and things of that nature where you can share your best practices and things of that nature, but understand it may not work in your facility. You may have to tweak it or change it because of the culture of your organization to make that same thing happen. You may never get to that same place, but you might get close or you might get something slightly different, but it fits your organization. You need to really understand that and embrace that. And so as you look to examples out there, and I'm going to be providing you some examples, use them as guides, but remember it's got to be internalized to your own organization in order to be effective. You can't just pick somebody else's stuff up and say, oh, we'll make it work here. Most importantly, it, it, it respects the need to independently and with dignity get to, get in, get around, and to meaningfully participate, engage with the content and programs. If you keep that in mind, this is our ultimate goal. You want your participants with disabilities to have the same or equivalent opportunity as your participants without disabilities. So the mindset that, well, we can help them do that. We can help them get up, you know, we, we'll um, you know, have somebody stationed at such and such. Think about it, is that the best way to do it? Does that allow the person to independently do that? Is that person going to be dependent upon somebody showing up at a certain time to open a door or do something? That's not necessarily giving them the same dignity and same rights as everybody else does, perhaps. So think about those as the context for a framework. And again, as you're selling these things or talking to your administration about these things. So let's talk about the cycle of planning for accessibility. Key, organizational commitment. How many of you here can say right now that you know you have organizational commitment to these issues? Unequivocally. Right. Obviously you're here so somebody paid your way and agreed budgetarily or otherwise that it was important for you to come to the conference. That's good. That's a step in the right direction, right? But you want to make sure that that's not just lift serve or lift service or placating you. 
and that there's real commitment into doing these things. So that message has to continually be brought forward. That message by you, but you also need your cohorts to help you bring that message to other people in your organization, not just the person who's responsible for, I saw all kinds of different uh, terminology, special populations and other kinds of things. Some of those terminologies drive me crazy. Um, uh, but you know, th th there's not just that rest in this one place or in this one office. That there's everybody, there's chemicals that go out in your organization that you've got buy-in from all of the different parties that they understand what their role in this is and that they are engaged and they are as excited about the potential or the possibilities as you might be. And so it starts from the top down is that you need to get your board and those that are engaged in making the funding decisions, things of that nature, understand the importance of these issues as you come to them with budgetary requests but all the way down to your maintenance staff who need to understand the importance of these issues as they help maintain things as accessible or that they're asked to make adjustments or changes and so that they understand the value of um, ensuring that these things are accessible and the importance of these issues and not that something can be fixed tomorrow when you have a show tonight that now means somebody's not going to have access because it's not been fixed. That You need that level at the very bottom as well as the top and everywhere in between. Your community, you need to engage your community. And what I mean by your community is your community as a whole. It's your disability community, but it's also your general community. Many of you know that sometimes you do get complaints from your patrons because they don't like some of the accessibility issues or they, they don't understand some of the accessibility issues. So when you have a captioned you know, version of something going on, people don't always understand. Some people will say, I don't want to um, come to the performance on a night that, that's captioned because it you know, bothers me. But they need to understand why you have a captioned performance and the importance of the captioned performance because on those nights that they prefer to come without any captioning means that somebody else who might need captioning can't come on that night because they don't have access. So we need to help everybody. It's our whole community. It's our disability community, but it's our general community as to why we do these things. Why do you see things that are different sometimes than what you might normally um, be used to or traditionally be, be used to seeing? You have to have some method of assessment and evaluation. You need to be looking at um, you know, how are we going to do this and what's the process. And again, we're going to talk more about that. But you know, notice that your community commitment comes before your assessment and evaluation. If you don't have the buy-in of your community of these things, you wasted your time with everything else. If you're not going to get people with disabilities to come to, the, to, your, to your community, to your performances or to your facilities and things of that nature, if you don't have and understand what they need and they want, then everything else becomes somewhat of a mute point. Looking at your policies, procedures, and practices to make sure that they are accessible follows into play. Then, train your staff. All those things beforehand do no good if your staff is not then trained on what to do. You can have the best policies, practices, and procedures in the world that are known by one person, you. And you'll fail. Even though you can pull out and say, well, we have a policy on that. You forgot to tell the person answering the phone how to take requests and what to do with those. And then that person says, well, we don't do this. We don't have a process for that. Yes, we do. Well, nobody even told me about it. I'm the one answering the phone. So if I don't know about it, I can't tell anybody about it. So it's really critically important to include that staff training. And then we have to communicate our accessibility issues, our access, et cetera, to our audience, to our visitors, to the community. If we don't tell the community about our accessibility and we have not been accessible for 55 years that we've been in existence, we cannot expect that we're going to overnight change the culture of our organization by having more people with disabilities attending, coming, and participating in our programs because we've been inaccessible for 55 years. They gave up trying to come to our facilities and trying to engage to our, in our facilities and things like that. Your word of mouth in the disability community is huge. How we find out about a lot of things. So if you're not telling me and you're not promoting that you now have accessible entrance, you now have accessible seating, you now have real-time captioning on such and such performances, you now have assistive listening devices and things of that nature, you now have a touch tour, you now have a whatever to your community, then you have wasted all of your time because your community is not going to come to you because you've been inaccessible all that this time.
evaluate and update. Make sure that you go through a process of evaluating what you've done, reassessment of it, and update as needed. The ABA Accessibility Guidelines changed in 2010. So if I did something back in 2004 and 2005, I needed to re-examine and re-look at those things in accordance with the 2010 ADA Accessibility Standards to think if, look to see if I need to make any changes or updates. Technology is changing at whirlwind speed. So technologies that we thought five years ago were providing great access are outdated, outmoded now, and our patrons are expecting something different, and there's probably a better mousetrap. We better know about it, consider it, aspire to it, if possible, to stay relevant and stay current. So that reevaluation is really important. And in the meantime, we probably have added things that we didn't think about or done other things that we need to make sure we included in our planning process. So, Looking at, from more resolution commitment, again, making a commitment. Adopt a written accessibility statement. One of the most powerful things you can do is to have a statement within your organization that articulates your commitment to accessibility. This is what the public sees. This is what your employees see, the new potential employee coming on board. Somebody who's newly considering they move to your community and is looking at buying a subscription to your uh, plays for the next year or whatever, or, or buying a, a, an annual pass or something of that nature to your museum or whatever else it might be. Designate a staff person to be the accessibility coordinator. Somebody needs to have it as their job. It should not be other duties as assigned. It should be somebody's responsibility to do this. There should be a point person. That doesn't mean that should be the only person and some of you are probably sitting in this room saying, I am the only person. But there needs to be somebody who is that point go-to person who understands who's looking above and knows when to reach out to the different parties that are involved or the different aspects of the organization to touch base with on things, to help coordinate those things, and be that voice saying, did you consider this? Did you do that? Did you do whatever at the appropriate time? And make sure you devote your resources to accessibility, both in staff time and dollars. Many of us are often frustrated because we have the title, but we have no dollars to do anything with. So there needs to be dollars available in the budgeting process to allow me to respond to accessibility issues. So that's where your commitment, if you can get these things from the top, you're more than halfway there. Just provide you a, some accessibility statements. So just an example from the Ohio Arts Council. They're committed to making arts accessible to all Ohioans. The agency believes that accessible buildings or spaces, programs, and creative opportunities enrich the artistic experiences of all and enhance the community's cultural climate. To that end, organizations that receive funding from the OHC must be fully accessible and inclusive to every individual, including people with disabilities and older adults. So this is a comment that they make, and this follows along with their funding when they make grants and things of that nature. This follows along with their statement of accessibility and such. Look at it, and there's other ones here as well. For those of you, I'm more than happy to share with you the PowerPoint. If you um, would like it, I can send it to you electronically or whatever, so you don't have to um, try to read my very small print. Um, now, all the way down to where the Kennedy Center is, very simple statement. Look at theirs. Kennedy Center welcomes patrons and visitors with disabilities. Says it all right there, right? So it really depends, again, organizationally, what do you do, what is the statement, but having a statement of some type is really important. Community engagement. Who are your members of the disability community? Do you know who the organizations are? Are you doing outreach to those organizations? Are you engaging or do you know if you want feedback or need feedback from stakeholder groups? Do you know who those stakeholder groups are? And I'm talking about cross-disability. I'm not just talking about going to the independent living center that might be in your community. That independent living center may serve a certain cross-sector of the population, but doesn't necessarily represent the entire disability population. So we have to be broader. We have to do a broader outreach than that. So we have to look at, are there specific disability groups that we're trying to make outreach to? Are we connecting with the organizations that represent the community of individuals with autism, or individuals who have mental illness, or individuals who have um, 
brain injury or who have Alzheimer's or who, are, who have you know, different um, deaf or hard of hearing or um, blind or low vision community. Um, not just the wheelchair users, not just the, you know, that group. And sometimes we tend to um, look to who we see in the community and that will often mean that we're missing out on a huge population of individuals who are also in our community who are not seen as visible or are not visible. So it does take some outreach. It does take getting to know and understand that disability community and being part of or participating in their programs and activities to get to know some of them so that you can create relationships, whether you bring them on as an advisory committee, whether you bring on certain individuals, look at who your patrons are, who might be um, regularly attending and coming, they might be good um, feedback loop for you, but often they may also already be the choir. And sometimes the hardest groups to meet, reach, are those that are not part of the choir, who are not yet coming to your facilities. You know why? Because they still don't know about you, they don't know what you offer, and they don't understand how that they can interact with you. So you need to get out there and engage with them. So connect, know who the, who the community is. Participate in their activities and invite them in to your activities. You know, a well-placed invite sometimes is amazing. And also that they see you out there interested in what they're doing and what's going on in the disability community. So if you have a pride, we have a disability pride parade in Chicago. And our arts community is part of the disability pride parade. So we have floats from some of our theater groups and things of that nature who have engaged in a part of that process who come and they participate in that pride day. The disability community looks at them, they have tables, they have exhibits and tables. After the, after the parade, there's people from the arts community that are part of that exhibit and table, distributing information to the public that are there about their programs and their facilities and their activities and things. That's how you get them to know you and you get to know them. Do you have people with disabilities on your staff? They may not be visible disabilities, may be invisible disabilities. Welcome those individuals to share and be part of that process. Listen to them. Look at who your knowledgeable and specialists are in your community, who specializes in architecture and accessibility, who specializes in serving certain populations and things of that nature. You might have professionals that you can also pull in to the party. And what role do you want them to play? Are they going to be an advisor group? Are they going to be a task force? Are they going to be a consultant? What role do you, but identify those things and, and have that list and have that ongoing outreach and engagement. When you're doing your assessment and your evaluation, you want to, again, as I said, identify your assets and your deficits. Survey your existing facilities. Get a good handle on what you already have. Survey your existing programs. And then you prioritize what needs to be fixed or what needs to be changed. So what directly affects the purpose of your organization? What amount of effort is it going to take to do it? And what's the cost? Sometimes it's easiest to do the low-hanging fruit, but that might not be the most important stuff. And then you've got big barriers taking place here. So sometimes it's easy to go after the easy stuff to try to pick it away. And sometimes strategically, that might be the way to go to get some things done. But don't be afraid to tackle the harder stuff. Because oftentimes the harder stuff is where your bigger barriers exist. How you balance it back. Again, keep in mind, behind the scenes, backstage, offices and other areas where your employees, where your artists or your performers are as well. Not just your traditional public space, but the other areas that have access as well. Do you do tours behind the scenes? Things of that nature. Then those are critical as well. There are some tools and checklists out there in the community to assist you in this process. Again, if you get my PowerPoint, you'll be able to get these. or direct hyperlinks to them. But the U.S. Department of Justice has a toolkit available um, that is specifically about that, um, about how to, if you're a Title 20, but it can also be adapted to, to Title 3. It covers everything from physical access to communication access to emergency planning. We often don't think about this issue of emergency planning, right? We think about evacuation, but do we consider people with disabilities in that evacuation process? And have we done that? Is that part of it? This should be inclusive of your planning. This is a program or an activity that you have. It's never a problem until it's a problem. And you have one fire or one situation that occurs during a performance or while you're open for business, and then you find the problem so it's a little bit too late. 
loss of life and other things can happen in the meantime. Advanced planning. We've had enough examples of things in this country to know what we should be thinking about and planning for. Oftentimes, so we don't include people with disabilities in that. Chicago Metropolitan Planning um, Association has a good transition plan, also um, uh, program that's uh, uh, resources as well. If you should do your survey of, of your facilities and such, there's a good um, uh, checklist of existing facilities done by the ADA National Network. It's an online tool that goes through all your facilities. This is great. I use this on my iPad, and I go along and I can input everything, you know, as I'm walking around and doing kinds of things, um, you know, right on my iPad. It then stores it. You can print it and, um, and use it. So it's an online tool. You also can download and use a paper and pencil, but I don't find paper and pencil to be as efficient anymore as far as trying to record things. It's nice because it has drop-down menus and things of that nature that you can select and choose from if you use the um, online version of it. So that's readily available for you, just ADA checklist org. Um, National Endowment for the Arts has a good checklist for our Arts and Humanities checklist is what it's called, accessibility checklist. Metropolitan uh, Regional Arts Council also has a good one. Um, the New Jersey Theater Alliance has a nice guide. There's also for a good uh, public guide, a planning guide for temporary events can be accessible. Sometimes all of our events are not in our facility. They might be out in the community. We might have whole festivals and things of that nature that are out in fields or in parking lots and things of that nature. So sometimes our events are temporary, not always in our structure. We need to think about those as well. There's a good guide linked to that as well that's available from the ADA National Network. Again, when you get my PowerPoint, all of these are active links. You'll be able to get and hook to all of them um, in the PowerPoint. Should note, though, that some of these resources were created prior to the changes in the ADA standards in 2010. So it's important to understand as you look at these things and that you may need to double check to make sure measurements and things of that nature are current in regards to they now have not all been updated. Like the, the temporary event guide is current, the ADA checklist is current, but some of the few other resources have not been updated um, yet. The structure is still there, the context is still there. It's just that if you start to go to look into inches and things of that nature, you want to check to make sure that you're using the correct measurements and such, um, that you're using the correct versions of those. All of these entities are in the process, of course, of updating, but you know how things can go. Probably took them 10 years to create the first one, so it might take them 10 years to update the second one. You know, that's reality, right? Unfortunately. Also, there's some um, examples internationally of things that have done. Remember, we don't have a, a, a lock in the corner on all of this, but there are other parts of the world who are also actively engaged in some of the things. So making Ontario accessible up in Canada has a very good accessibility guide um, around policies and procedures and things of that nature. Um, you have the Discrimination Act in the UK. It has a good accessibility planning process. Again, these would be relative to their laws and things, but it does still give you another framework to look at um, to see what others might be doing internationally. And then Access Arts Australia is known as being um, uh, more progressive in this area as well. They have some good um, advice and tip sheets that you might want to consider that might be applicable to what you're doing when you could adapt from them. So as you start your, your survey or you are starting the consideration for doing your survey, again, you want to start with what is currently accessible and what needs improvement. What actions need to be taken? What are order and priority? What would be your estimate? of the actual cost to take the action, which department or who is responsible. So you might have stage manager and then the name after it, but you're still going to include the stage manager as the position that's responsible, and for right now it might be Bobby. But you want to maintain it with the stage manager still also, because when Bobby changes, it's still stage manager. A timeline. What are your anticipated completion dates? Include both long and short term goals. So you may have a stepped process that for the next six months we're going to do this, and then, then you know the long term goal is in four years after we've done our capital campaign, we're going to get to this. But we have steps in between. So right now we have temporary parking over on this side, or we have a temporary entrance or whatever while this entrance is being undertaken construction. Or our seating is here for accessibility at, for right now while we construct the other seating areas over here. So you've got a short term and you have a long-term goal. And what are your time frames? Even if you don't meet your time frames, it's really important to put time frames on there. It keeps things moving. If you leave it open-ended, you have nothing to be accountable or nothing to be able to go to, for, uh, forward to. So it may be that you end up adjusting your time frames,
because you weren't able to meet them and such, but still is important to include them because it does help us give us guidance and keeps us moving. Here's just an example of a worksheet for um, access planning. So this would be looking at it, you look at your um, access variables, but first you can identify where is the location that I'm going to do my access um, uh, with, what are the issues that I'm actually looking at, in this case it's horizontal, um, up and down uh, um, circulation. So what is our barrier that we have, um, uh, there's a mobile that does not allow a minimum headroom of 80 inches that is interfering with people mobilizing in a certain space. So what are we going to do to reach our solutions? I'm going to identify what resources I'm going to use to do that. We're going to have a, a meeting to do it. We're going to get some outside estimates of costs to change or up, uh, uh, raise that. We're going to do a follow-up meeting. Um, and then we're going to take action. So we've got a plan in place of what we're going to do, who is responsible, what are our budgetary considerations for that, what's our start date, and what's our end date. Very simple. But it gives us a way to track what we're doing and, and document what so you don't have to have any fancy anything. This is just very simply created type thing. And there are in, in the guides that you're going to see, if you follow some of my links, you'll see some of these worksheets available that can be downloaded and customized or adapted for your use. This is another type of uh, a worksheet again. Here's what my area, my facilities access, my priority, steps or measurable objectives, target completion, who's responsible. Just another form of the same thing. Notice it's got dates. It identifies who did it, when they did it. That's important so you can track, so you have to go back and ask questions maybe. Photos are very important in this process. Take a picture of what you're dealing with so that you don't have to constantly go back to the site or whatever and look at it and you can pinpoint it. Now with digital cameras, who cares how many pictures you take? Just have to have storage for them. But photos can be really important. Also, they're great. They tell a great before and after story. When you want to show what you've done, you now have that. Here's what it looked like before. Here's what it looks like after. So record and think about that as well. When you're looking at your policy procedures and practices, again, review and update your existing policies and practices. Review what you already have in place. Does it need to be enhanced? Does it need to be changed? Maybe you have an old policy on sign language interpreters that said two weeks notice is needed. Things have changed. <coughs> two weeks. Two weeks may no longer be applicable. Maybe you can do a 72 hour because you have more resources in your community and such of that nature. You need to update those things and make sure that they're current. Maybe you're using different vendors. Maybe you have a different process in place. So determine if a new one needs to be addressed, maybe something's missing. And then you can add it and make sure that your practices are consistent with your policies and procedures. Oftentimes we see things written that actual practice is different. Our policies and procedures should reflect our actual practices. This is where you become vulnerable from a complaints and a litigation perspective. If you have somebody doing a practice that's not consistent with your policies and, pra and procedures that are written and documented. You can always go above careful not to go below, and make sure you're consistent. Because that's, again, one person saying one thing, another person saying something different. you got to be consistent. Policies are big pictures, if you don't know the differences in what we're talking about. Policy lays forth the big picture issue. It's a policy that we shall include all people with disabilities. That's our policy. It's a policy that we shall provide sign language interpreters for our performance, that we will provide effective communication for our performances would be a broader policy. And your procedure is, what is the process that you go through in order to, to get to that? How do you implement that policy? So what's our procedures for requesting? a sign language interpreter, for scheduling a sign language interpreter, for paying for a sign language interpreter. And then practices are how we ret routinely carry out those policies and procedures. So when you think about writing the policy, the policy is global, you shouldn't have specificity in your policy. Your policy should state what you're going to do and what your outcome is. 
Then your procedure should give your details, who, what, when, and where, and then your practices should reflect your procedures. Again, keep in mind that it's an ADA obligation of Section 504, depending if you're federally funded as well, to make reasonable accommodation modifications to your policies, practices, and procedures. So you may have a no pets policy, but you would be modifying that for a service animal because a service animal is not a pet. Okay? So it's okay for you to have a no pets policy, but you need to be able to make modifications of that policy when necessary. So that would be something you would address like in your procedures and such. So there's seven steps recommended to craft, or eight steps, I guess my numbers are wrong, to craft policies and procedures. One, clearly identify the issue. Do your homework to make sure that you will address to know and understand the legal implications for that issue. Create a draft of your policies and procedures then vet them. Get feedback on them. Have somebody else read them. If appropriate, include some of your stakeholders in reviewing them. Have those people that would be responsible for implementing review them. Is this really what, is this realistic? Is this not realistic? Should we do something differently? Should we add a step? Take out a step? Rewrite as needed, incorporating the feedback that you get and then distribute and train all staff. Don't pick and choose. Some staff may need to have more intense or more detail, but all staff should be aware of your general policies, practices, and procedures, even that custodial staff. Even those volunteers, those interns, they are still you when they're functioning in their positions, which means that they need to own and understand what you do and how you do it. They will be your lowest denominator for getting you in trouble. Post for the public as applicable on your website, brochures, etc. So if you have policies for inclusion, if you have practices and procedures for requesting accommodations and things of that nature, or for uh, requesting or initiating or using or doing certain things or areas you can access or not access, etc., let the public know that. Hiding that information does you no good. If I can't come and find out, I'm going to not necessarily choose to participate in your program or activity because I don't have enough information and I'm not going to want to have to ferret it out by calling everybody and stuff to try to get that information. I want to look for it and have it easily readily available. I want a commitment. I want to see there's a commitment from you as your organization to do these things. I'm going to be looking for that information. If I'm a visitor, if I'm a regular, I'm whatever. So think about posting to the public. And then establish a review process to ensure that you remain current and relevant. Whether it be reviewed on a yearly basis, reviewed every two years, whatever works in your organization, make sure that you have a process. Because I don't want to see a policy when I come into your organization that was written in 1999 that has never been updated. So even if you don't change it, date it as to when it was last reviewed. Because you may be gone and the next person coming in does not know when this was last reviewed. So even if you didn't make the change, still date, review, such and such a date. And that helps you keep track of what you've done and where you're going and what may or may not have changed or needed to change. Staff training I've talked a lot about again. All staff and volunteers interacting with the public should receive training. Um, they are your public face of your institution. And they can make or break you in your experiences. Make sure that they can communicate clear and articulate information and empower them to take action as needed. Don't handcuff them that they can't, they're not empowered to help somebody do something or, or do some, you know, respond to questions. If nothing else, empower them to know where to go to get additional information or assistance. They may not actually be the one who does it, but at least they're empowered to know where they can go to get it versus being, I, I was never taught that, I was never shown that. I'm too low on the totem pole for that. As I said, push information on about accessibility. Some entities will actually, in their playbill or whatever, have a whole little piece on accessibility. 
They'll have an area of their website of accessibility. They'll have a um, whole brochure about accessibility and the options that are available. It's really up to you and what works best in your organization. But make sure that, again, it's something that easily can be found out by people. Use your existing and your, and your traditional marketing tools um, for promotion and such. Use social media, but make sure it's accessible when you use it. So if you're going to put out something um, in your social media that's a video, make sure it's a captioned video. Don't put out a video that's not captioned um, and such. If your website, make sure your website's accessible. If it's through word of mouth, make sure it's accurate. That's all you, you, know, you can do. But use the traditional ways that you do things, but just incorporate and make sure that you're doing it accessible. Too much, I mean, there's some sessions being held here at a conference here about social media and accessibility and things of that nature. These are really critical as you're using more and more of the Snapchats and the whatevers and you know who knows with Pokemon Go now where your people are going to be you know showing up at your facilities chasing. You might just get more business because there's a pokey something sitting in your uh, you know your museum or in your uh, on your stage somewhere. Um, but if you're going to use those, engage with those kinds of things, make sure it's successful that your uh, activities and programs are taken into consideration. Um, people with disabilities again cross um, uh, sensory issue, you know, whether it's hearing, whether it's um, visual impairment, whether it's somebody who has um, high anxiety issues or, or, it's, or it's somebody who has uh, cognitive disability or whatever else it may be, think about multiple ways that we reach out and ensure that they're accessible. And as I said, evaluate um, and make sure that you update it. So evaluate accessibility periodically. You may think everything's accessible and you didn't realize for the last six months somebody on staff has been stacking up a bunch of boxes in the back area that you don't go on a regular basis, which has narrowed the hallway from 36 inches to 24 inches. And nobody's complained, but that doesn't mean that it should stay that way. So sometimes you just need to go through and do walkthroughs and things of that nature to see and look and make sure and evaluate that your accessibility is still as you would know it or understand it as accessible and what you thought it was as accessible. And this is across seasons. For some of us that live in seasonal areas, where we have snow and we have uh, wind and we have rain and we have other things that happen. Things that are accessible in the summer may not be accessible in the winter or during certain kinds of weather and stuff. Check those things out, evaluate those things uh, the same way. And again, don't let your plan become static. It needs to be living and reflect your current practices. If you're somebody who likes to do steps versus cycles of doing things, there's also some additional resources that I'm providing you that the uh, Association of Science and Technology Centers has a five-step access plan process that you can go through. The National Endowment for the Art Arts has a 10-step process you can go through. And Texas Commission on Arts and Arts Ms. West both have 12-step. Um, so it depends on whether you're a part of a 12-step program, 10-step program, or a five-step program. But some people just like steps instead of processes. So there's other ways to look at your planning process. These are another just some additional um, resources for you. Again, there are live links on the PowerPoint that as soon as you um, get it or receive it, you'll be able to follow um, those. But there are some good um, tools and good things that you can look at or reflect upon or um, use as a way to uh, address your process. Some could be adopted as they stand or at the face value. Other of them maybe just need to be tweaked. Get pick and choose what works best for you out of all of those things. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of work that's already been done that you can adapt. So part of that overwhelming freak out process is know that others have done it before you. They've lived. They're still here. Some of them probably at this conference. Um, and it is not the worst thing in the world. It will be and can be if you haven't done it, your organization has done it. It can consume your time and efforts for a period of time. But once you've done it, once you have it in place, once you've laid all of that out, then it's just about maintenance like anything else is. But it does give you that plan, and it should give you the leverage with your management to be able to document and show them. It's one thing to talk about areas of barrier or that we're not as inclusive. It's another to be able to actually show them where those barriers exist to get that buy-in. And of course, they like and they understand dollars and money, and so the more that you can document what it's going to cost, and then also what the benefit is. You know, as you're in your evaluation process, if you can show, I mean, I was at a session earlier today where somebody was talking about when they instituted um, uh, sign language tours. Initially, they started out with 10 people or whatever. Now it's paying for itself and it's bringing more people in to the facility who would never have come before who are now buying passes and becoming regular patrons in the facility. So it's a new marketplace. So even though there's a cost 
associated with that, they brought in a whole new marketplace. That talks to management. That talks to your board in such that nature that you're expanding your memberships or your participation and things of nature across the those areas. So again, having plans, having these things in place go a long way to helping you in making some of those arguments because you have the ability to send benchmark, benchmarks and then document against those benchmarks as well. All right, we're at that period or that time in the whole process here, which um, we're ready to take some questions from people. So um, hopefully you have questions for me. Anyone have some questions or anything that you've done in your organization that you would like to share as part of this process? Don't be shy. Absolutely not. Yes, go ahead. I'm gonna run over with the microphone. Hi, so earlier you had mentioned something I run into quite a bit, which is how to get patrons in the general population to buy into your accessibility. Um, and what kind of tips do you have for those patrons that feel like you're now excluding them because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's an issue of education and, and making sure that there's a clear understanding. One, that they're, you know, that you're not excluding them. You are offering a different experience. And so that they don't like that particular experience, that they have other options for when they can come and, and go and such of that nature. And that what you are trying to do is make sure that you can offer an array of experiences to meet the needs of a variety of different people in the community. Sometimes, I mean, the ones that we see a lot of times, or I hear about a lot of times, especially sometimes your older population who is used to something being done a certain way, um, a certain time, and such that nature, they often are resistive to the new technologies being used because it changes the experience. They find like the caption to be distracting, you know, for them or whatever else it might be. Um, I think that sometimes you just have to do, go through the explanation to them that why that benefits for some people and that, you know, this is the performances that we have that are captioned and there are non-captioned performances for you and yes, you have liked to come the third Friday of every month, but right now, the third Friday of every month, this is the month, that, you know, the date that we're doing our um, captions, um, our program, and we'll switch that around, you know, um, and such, but for right now, that's the way it is. I think we just have to be upfront with people and tell them while still have our nice voice. Um, you know, uh, about that, but I think that the more that we can educate and tell them why we're doing it, who benefits from it. Also, I think go beyond the traditional population that you might think of, the people who are deaf and hard of hearing that use it, but there are a lot of people with learning disabilities who have auditory processing disorders who benefit from uh, real-time captioning. Individuals who English is not their, sec is their second language also benefit from the captioning because they may um, actually read English better than they understand or comprehend um, written. I know that I read Spanish better than I can speak Spanish. Um, so there's different you know, things of that nature. So I think you just have to take it outside um, of an, a, as broad an audience as you possibly can and say that this is you know, what we're doing to be more inclusive, um, to ensure that all of our patrons who wish to participate in our programs and activities have an opportunity to do so, and that you know, maybe you need to, to look at another night, and we will be shifting these around so that you can, your Friday night will be back again in April. You know, or whatever. I just think that you do, the more that you can do to educate in a nice way and demonstrate the, the, who uses it, etc. And uh, of course now there's different technologies being used too, you know, so maybe this is also cute for you as an organization to look at maybe using the traditional LED display for your time that you're for your real time captioning is something that you might move away from to start to explore the other options and other technologies that are available that are more individualized and not used by everybody so you don't have that same experience like the, you know, the LED display at my seat, you know, or, or the rear window captioning or other kinds of things that, you know, are out there available. Um, that's, you know, moving technologies to use in other ways that don't have the same distraction, you know. Um, we have another question yeah. over here in this part of the room, so I'm going to pass off the Sure. A very quick question. So you talked under the make a commitment uh, section of your presentation about des designating a staff person to be the accessibility coordinator. Many of our organizations are all volunteer run or very part time executive director manager. Um, would you recommend in a working board environment that you would designate a single volunteer form a board committee, an accessibility committee, or does this live with the executive committee or what kind of structure there uh, for the working board? That's a great question. So I think it really depends again about your organization. I think that, you know, even if you're using all volunteers, if you could have somebody who's, you still need that point person somewhere. 
You know, that one person, if you, if you diffuse it too much, then everybody doesn't know what the other hand is doing and what's happening or going on. So even if you could get a volunteer who would agree that they will be the point person, they may not be the one doing everything, but they are the point person who takes the responsibility for the coordination of those things. Other people, volunteers, might be responsible for certain aspects, other aspects, because it can't rest on all one person, because they are volunteer, but that one person is the one who would be the go-to to be able to find out what's happening, going on, or for um, help with you know, assigning it to other people. I think having an advisory group external to, you know, is a, is a great another way, especially in a volunteer organization type of a structure, is that if you, you know, it's another way to get another group of hands of people to give you input and things of that nature. Whether that works in your existing advisory by including somebody with a disability into your advisory, your overall general audience advisory, or whatever your groups are called, ensuring that there's somebody with a disability, you know, there. Uh, there's a big um, pitfall or potential with um, uh, only one person or whatever in that kind of context is. No one person can represent, represent all disability issues. You know, and I, I find that even with my staff, I have somebody on my staff who goes out and does architectural accessibility surveys and he's somebody in a wheelchair. And I constantly have to remind him about looking at sensory issues and things of that nature because he's really strong on those physical disability issues because they're his own issues, right? And he sometimes forgets or is not as strong on some of those other issues that I'm always having to dog him. And now he knows even before I say it. You know that, that he does it because he's learned that he has to do that. But it's, you do have to, to think about the fact that people are oftentimes only representative of their own lens. Not always do they represent, and can they speak for everybody? So that's a, you know a, 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 a catch twenty two. But you know sometimes we also it may not be because your organization is small enough where we can't manage or it's too cumbersome to do the advisory board thing. Having listening sessions where you, a couple times a year, invite people from the community, might be part of your audience participation, or might be groups that you invite, having listening sessions where they come in, they may not be a formal structure, but you're offering an open time to come in and do that type of a thing and give us feedback and, and, and such, that's another way to also manage that kind of a thing, to make sure that you, you know, are, are still getting that voice, but may not structurally be able to handle having something. Hello. Uh, thank you so far for everything you've said. Extraordinarily, extraordinarily helpful. Uh, small board question regarding service animals, therapy dogs and such. In my first encounter with that, I had a security guard who had said, no, this isn't a service animal. And I said, just, if they say it's a service animal, it's a service animal. Now I'm wondering about, on the other end, uh, the liability end, if somebody, so has there been an expanded definition of service animal? Uh, I'm thinking of an occasion where somebody came in with what was a toy poodle, mm -hmm. um, and the dog was a little vicious. Uh, so I, I, it was a, a warning bell to me that maybe this person is gaming the system and not really bringing in a service dog. So any any information would be sure. extraordinarily helpful. Sure, sure. Um, any, um, any law or any regulation has the potential for abuse. You know, and this is no different than anything else. There has not been, the, the last most recent change in relationship to service animals and such came with the 2010 amendments to the Title II and Title III regulations by the U.S. Department of Justice, whereby they restricted a service animal to a um, dog, domestic dog, and or with the exception of a miniature horse in certain circumstances and, and scenarios. So that's clear. But there are other state laws in our states across the country which recognize in some of those laws things beyond a domestic dog. So one, that's key. You have to know what your state laws are or your local laws are in relationship to this particular issue. It also makes a distinction between an emotional support animal and a service animal. A service animal is an animal that provides an actual service. An emotional support animal is an, uh, uh, a dog or animal that provides me emotional support. That's not a service. It's emotional support. It makes me feel better, etc. Service is I actually perform a service. So for example, somebody might have um, because of PTSD, might have an emotional support dog that makes them feel more comfortable or more secure. They also might have a psychiatric service dog that's been trained to actually do something as it relates to their PTSD, such as um, alert them to when there's triggers uh, that set off their, their PSTD. That dog may be trained to actually put a paw on the person or maybe actually to, to redirect them, to pull them away from an area, to distract them, etc. So there's a difference between a service dog and an emotional support dog. So that's a key issue. Dogs come in all sizes and shapes. They could be a pit bull, they could be a, um, a, uh, um, a miniature poodle. They provide different types of services. So for example, dogs are also used for um, alerting individuals to medical conditions. 
So for example, somebody might have one because of diabetes, and that dog has been trained to sense the change in my chemical structure of my body, I emit a odor that is not detectable to you and I, but it will be trained to be detectable for that dog. That miniature um, poodle, who you and I might think um, should not be, um, is not a service animal, could actually be providing that kind of service. It's not going to open the door, you know, it's not going to do a lot of other things. You're not going to pull my wheelchair, but it could be doing that kind of service. They, it, so, so be open and broad to that. Train your staff for the fact that service animal comes with different issues. Look at your policies, practices, and procedures as it relates to things like behavior, okay? So a dog that is trained as a service animal should not growl, should not bark, should not be running around, you know, doing zoomies or anything of that nature, okay? That is not a trained service animal. So your staff should be trained to look at those kinds of things. You want to be careful that your staff are not making judgments based on personal biases and things of that nature as well. So you want to have some, you know, checks and balances in relationship to those things and such of that nature. But I'm not required to tolerate a dog um, that is growling or that is snapping at people or anything of that nature. My denial in that situation would be of the access to the dog, not the patron. Um, so that, you know, say that the, you know, you're perfectly welcome here, it's just that the dog cannot because of the, the, the venue or such of that nature. This is a constant um, ongoing issue. You need as an organization, this is where your policies, practices, and procedures come in. The only permissible questions that you can ask under the ADA um, is, is that animal trained to provide a service? You cannot ask what the service is. Um, can't ask about the disability, okay? Um, and so you, you're very limited in your what what you can ask about that. So, yes, correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, can't get ask what the disability itself is. So and you cannot require me. Uh, this kind of was it. You can ask the about what the task is. You can ask about the disability. You also cannot ask me to demonstrate it. So you can't ask me, show me that that dog picks things up, or show me that that dog, you know, alerts you to a, you know, a seizure, or whatever it is. Yeah, have a seizure so I can see it. Um, you can't ask that as well. Um, there is no uh, certification program, so you can't ask me to show you a card that shows that the dog is certified. You can't ask me to show any documentation of the fact that the dog has been trained. You cannot require that the dog have a specific harness on it that says it's a service animal or anything of that nature. Um, the dog should be um, contained or tethered um, in, in some way, um, but it could be different depending on the person's disability. The dog could actually be untethered because the person with a disability can't manage a tether, but it has to be under control of that individual. So as long as that dog is under my control, voice control, etc., I'd be fine. Um, I just can't um, allow it. So this goes back to your policies, practices, and your training. You should be training your staff about these issues. They should understand, you should have these conversations. Bring the case studies in. What if this happens, how are you going to respond? And what are you going to do, and who are you going to talk to, or who are you going to go to? This goes into that planning process that you have. Having a um, policy that just says service animals would be uh, allowed, now what's our procedures related to that? Are there any procedures, are there any practices that we have in place related to those kinds of things? And how are we going to train our staff to do those? manage that. And don't be surprised that you're going to have abuse. You have abuse of a lot of other, take disability out of it. You have people who try to sneak food in, drinks in, other kinds of things all the time. So you have abuse on a regular basis of your policies, practices, and procedures. Yeah. Any other questions? And my contact information is up here um, as well. If you ever want to reach me. Hi, I just stepped in late and I just wanted to know how to access this PowerPoint. Okay, so I said that before. I would make it available to anybody. Um, I, the Kennedy Center collects it, but if anybody wants to leave me a, a business card or anything up here um, today or uh, whatever, I'm more than happy to send it to you. It has a lot of active links on it. As I said, that, that would be very helpful to people to have the actual PowerPoint versus just a copy of it because the PowerPoint has a lot of active links. Any other questions? I think we're one minute, I think, or whatever. Five, oh, five minutes. We have five more minutes. I'm done. Go ahead. We're giving you a workout with this large room. That's good. Uh, this may be kind of a, a rookie question or a, uh, too specific, but um, I'm curious about accessible ticketing. Um, 
in the interest of being inclusive and offering the same experience and, and being respectful. Um, I, I know that many, many organizations do offer accessible prices for caption performances or just a broad blanket accessible ticketing price. Um, I'm curious about the legality of that or the appropriateness of that. Um, yeah. So, this is a very good question. There's a lot of debate and discussion in the community about this particular issue. There's nothing legally that requires you to provide any kind of discounts or any special specific pricing as it would relate to um, people with disabilities. Okay? The issue in the ticketing arena is depending on whether you are an existing facility trying to incorporate accessibility and you cannot inc incorporate accessibility at all your price levels, you may have to adopt your policies, practices, and procedures to modify ticketing pr uh, uh, prices in areas where you do have access proportionally. And there's going to be a session, I don't think it's today, it's tomorrow, um, that is on accessible ticketing, which I would really strongly advise. Betty Siegel will be doing that um, session. Betty's also done a number, if you can't go to that one tomorrow, she's also done a number of webinars, um, particularly for the National ADA Network that are available online on this particular issue as well, that you can access um, uh, through adata.org, um, which is the uh, National ADA uh, website as well, but it, it is a very good session. We'll talk about that issue. When you talk about, so let's talk about it in the context of just saying we're going to give discounted ticketing for, ticketing for people with disabilities. That is something that would be the, totally, nothing about the law would prohibit you from being able to do that. If you want to provide specialized ticketing for seniors, you want to buy specialized ticketing for children under age of certain whatever, or uh, people with disabilities, whatever, that would be your choice to, to do that. That is something that you as an organization for policy practicing and ticketing policies, there is nothing that says you have to provide people with disabilities, you know, um, to do that. Some um, argue against against those kinds of models. They feel that that's a charity model that gives the wrong message in regards to people with disabilities in the community. Others feel that you know that they, if they already have an income program, that maybe that's what your program should be is a low income program for people who meet a certain income because there are people with disabilities who make hundreds of thousands of dollars um, so you know there's there's you know there's not necessarily you know that the cheaper being you know the, the best way to it, do that kind of thing so you know think about that but, but there's not a legal there would be potentially though in the ticket arena depending on your seating issues if you cannot provide me the $25 seat that's accessible or the $10 seat that's accessible because you don't have access to those areas, you may need to sell me a ticket in the $100 section for $10, okay? But that's to create my access and equal access to the event, to the performance versus a program that gives a discount to people with disabilities. Totally separate issue. But again, something you should be addressing in your policies, practices, and procedures. How do we implement those? Maybe we want to reevaluate whether we have those or not, or how we couch those, not being just disability, but maybe a low-income program versus, because there's a lot of people who don't have money. We likely have time for one more quick question. Does anybody have a, yeah, here we go. I realize I should have asked this two questions ago, but uh, this is regarding service animals. Sure. Um, so how would you, um, how would you, I guess, um, reject someone who clearly has a therapeutic dog or does not um, respond well, or does not necessarily have a service animal? How, how would you say no? Do that. So again, you have to decide what's within the culture of your organization to do that, who's the appropriate person to do that in your organization and how you know, to, to handle that. Um, but first, your first thing would be make, what's, our, what's our objective um, reasons why we would be um, deciding that that animal um, is not appropriate to be in our venue. Um, so, for example, it could be that um, the animal is barking or do whatever, and we have a policy against disruptive behavior. And so that's the policy that we're implementing, and so we attempt to you know, approach the person on the fact that, you know, your um, animal, is, you're perfectly welcome to be here, however, your animal is disruptive, you know, um, in, in the circumstance, and we're going to ask that your animal be, be removed, but you're welcome to come back, you know, and see. So, you know, it's never comfortable. Oh, they're never comfortable you know, scenarios to do. But be objective about what the behavior is or the circumstance or the situation for why you are removing it. Don't be, I think, don't use those kinds of terminologies. Be it based on observable behaviors and such that are not consistent with the operations of the organization. Okay, so there was a, a case in, um, in the courts whereby a, um, a person brought a bull mastiff 
and everybody knows Bull Mastiff is a very large dog. It's about 200 pounds, anyway. Um, she used it for mobility, this woman did. She bought it into a movie theater. It was on a Sunday afternoon during a matinee time with zillions of kids and, and crowds and things of that nature. That theater entity made the decision that that dog was not appropriate in that venue because of the crowds. It was fearful, it was scaring the kids and things that should do with size and stuff of that nature. They offered the woman a couple of options. One, that she could come back at other times. They gave her identified times when they were less crowded and they were having a problem. She could leave the bull mastiff, the, the animal, in the manager's office while she was in, you know, in the, at the performance and then retrieve the dog afterwards, et cetera. She disagreed with all of those. She sued the movie theater. The movie theater was in court. The movie theater won. They had offered reasonable options, and it was deemed that it was because of the circumstance and the situation of the size of the dog, the venue, how crowded it was, they had documentation of their of their venue and stuff of that nature, so they were successfully able to argue that. So you have to just be use a real objective information and, and be consistent in your practices. All right. Well, I think we're at time. Um, I want to say a tremendous thank you uh, for leading the session, and maybe we can give a, a round. Of And thank you all for coming. And if you want to give me business cards or anything up here, I'm more than happy to take them.